Great. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming today. Um, I, my name is Nicole Kusold Matteo. I'll be your moderator today. And I just have a, a few notes um, before we get started, OK? Um, we welcome today David Antoline from Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, he will be presenting the white costumes, Slovenian folk costumes from the Pannonian region. And on behalf of all of the volunteer organizers of Cleveland Karantavania, I welcome all who are here today in this building, as well as those who are joining us online. Uh, this year, as always, our Arts and Culture Festival strives to promote our Slovenian cultural heritage, shine a light on the St. Clair Superior neighborhood, which we are here today, and have fun. And I think that this event hits on all three of those. Thank you to the unwavering support from our attendees and participants, our sponsors, and our volunteers. We are now seeing our 12th annual Cleveland Karantavania, so 12 years and going. Um, I want to take a note and talk about where we are today. So for those of you who are in person, you have the experience of, you have the experience of being in this beautiful, newly renovated rec center. But for those of you who are online, I want to note that um, we are so grateful to the city of Cleveland and for the staff at the Kovacic Rec Center for having us today. The building that we're in is named after Edward J. Kovacic, who lived from 1910 to 1973. He was a Slovenian American who served as the rec center's first director and then later as a council person who represented the neighborhood and its residents um, in part during the East Ohio gas explosion, which was a major event for the Slovenian American community and the neighborhood. In 1977, the facility here was named after him to honor his contributions to the citizens of St. Clair neighborhood and the city of Cleveland. Before I begin, I do want to thank our sponsors. Our 2024 presenting sponsors are the American Mutual Life Association and Shaliga. And we are so grateful to the unwavering support of both of those sponsors for their financial contributions, as well as our other sponsors who help us cover the numerous costs associated with putting on an eight day festival. Um, I also want to say that Cleveland Transylvania is supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. And we are grateful to the CAC for their unwavering support as well. We are also thankful to our numerous partners and our numerous volunteers who have all in some way, shape or form contributed to bringing this programming this year and every year to life. Without further ado, I hand it over to David. I'm mic'd up, right? Is that, can you hear me if I speak like this? We're good? Okay, I don't need that, we're good. Welcome, uh, 12th year of Kurem Tovanya. This is my third attendance. Uh, I was here on year two as one of the Kurems, but it, I was referred to as the Canadian Kurem because I brought my own. <laughs> um, quite an old guy. And it was, it was quite interesting going over the border thinking, are they going to ask you what you have in the back? But we were that here. And then last year, I, uh, I received an um, invite and said, would you talk about costumes? And then uh, to, to say last year was overwhelming for me. Um, it, it was a great weekend. Um, you know, a one hour lecture, haha, went into, if you were there, you, you listened to it, it went that much longer. And then the amount of questions went that much longer. And then uh, there was a lot of conversation. There was a lot of emails. Uh, there was a, there's a lot of people interested, at least, and, and a lot of people in various parts of that journey trying to find out maybe their roots or maybe where they're from. Or everybody wants to know, what is the costume from this village? Everybody wants to know if there is a specific one. Um, so last year, there was an over, overall uh, seminar. I know there was a lot of information that was there. And I'm the type of person that I'd like to be as thorough as possible and, and then realize, well, we can't do it all in an hour. Um, and that's why when I mentioned that there are three types of costumes uh, for this time around, and speaking with Nikki and going back and forth trying to see, you know, to arrange something, uh, I said, let's do the whites, right? And I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that. We also, have, we also have a couple here in a different costume than I'm in. Does anybody know what costume I have, by chance? Go ahead. I don't know if I ever wore this yet. This one was made for me so many years ago. So I thought I was going to put it on display. Go, oh, heck with it. You know what? It fits. So it's good. Um, maybe the vest doesn't that as well as it should, but uh, it is what it is, right? And both of them are in Bela Kraina or a version of Bela Kraina. So these are types of things that I'm going to hopefully, you know, 
get your curiosity going. Um, I'm going to kind of plug in, this is on Facebook. Now, I'm not gonna say that this is an absolutely fabulous place, but it's a pretty good place because um, I think the information that is there is going to be as accurate as I could possibly say because I'm the editor or I'm the person that runs this one. All right, and I've had a lot of uh, groups in Slovenia have sent so many different things and it, it, uh, it gets overwhelming for me. But if you are interested in even some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today or some of the imagery, I've had a lot of people who talk about the imagery, where can I get that photo? Or you know, what can I, you know, or what is out there? Take a pop there and I'll show you this again just at the very end because that way, you know, if by chance you're interested that way, it's basically a blog, right? You can agree, you can disagree in, in, in it, but uh, I think some of the information there is pretty worthwhile or it can be pretty worthwhile. So <coughs> here we go. So the whites. So we're going to be talking about what is considered to be the Pannonian regions of Slovenia. I'm going to break this every so often because there's a few of these marginal areas that can be considered almost, they can be considered alpine in what they wear, okay? Um, they always say that, you know, the clothes make the man, right? And way back when, everyone wore what they could afford, right? And the, using the materials they could get. And you have to also understand the materials that you had as maybe a lower status person uh, was actually regulated. You cannot, you could not have certain materials because someone who was of nobility was the only one that was allowed to have silk, all right? And a lot of these regions were actually feudal. So there were lords and, lords and ladies that took care of them, all right? So originally being from the Prekmuria region, there was actually a grofica in Beltinci. And my grandmother remembered that she had to work as a young girl a certain amount of days for her to get things done when it came to harvesting and things. Those types of things are, we think are so far back, but they're not as far back as, they, as we really think. So there are three regions that are actually represented there and there'll be more later as we go, all right? The one on the very left hand side is Bela Kraina. If you look at it, that might be a different image compared to what you think, you know, what will work. Over to the very right on the very top, that's the oldest picture for Prekoria. Okay. And down below, it's more of a later image, and that's Stairska. I should interject that I am also part Stairska. So I got to make sure because I don't want to, I don't want any of my relatives saying that I did not say that part. All right. So, oops, sorry. Here we go. Let's do this. All right. So, Slovenians in, in general, you know, depending on which maps, we always like to go to historic maps and everybody, all these nationalities want all the area. Slovenians were found in throughout many areas that are, no, that are not in the so-called border of Slovenia. Some of you are familiar with that. You might, be a, might go to areas where you actually see a name that is Slavic, but they don't speak any type of Slavic, back, uh, Slavic language, all right? Ironically speaking, again, this may not be Correct, but you know, if we go to a certain map, we can actually put Cleveland, Ohio there as well because the amount of Slovenians that were in Cleveland, Ohio, it was the second largest Slovenian population. Out, you know, not just outside of Slovenia, Ljubljana was number one, Cleveland was second Ljubljana. Right? You have to think about that, right? And so there were uh, Slovenians in, of course, in Italy, in Croatia, in Austria, and in Hungary in particular because the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, right? There was, the borders were a lot different at that time. All right, so this is what we know. These are all the municipalities, right? And these are all the languages. Hey, God bless us. We speak a lot of different dialects. In, in truth, I think we speak a lot more of these dialects. This is what, you know, the linguists say. These are the general words. I can tell you that my wife's um, parents are from villages that are close by and they have different words. I always joke about that, right? He said, well, we don't say it like that. And again, when you go to a different region, you know, if I spoke Prekmusko to you, many of you are gonna look at me saying, what did he just say, right? That's just the way things are, right? So, but if we put all of those together, you know, these are the municipalities, you realize that 
Even nowadays, there are uh, minorities outside of the actual borders. Those are found, of course, in Italy and in Austria, and a little bit up there in Hungary, that little mustard area. We're going to talk about that one coming up. So these are the areas, these are the old regions. Nowadays, they have different names for these. These are the ones that a lot of people go by, all right? Or we go by as folklorists, all right? So we are not going to be talking about all of them. We are only going to be talking about these, all right? And we'll start up on the very top, all right? So how do we go about starting to talk about costuming? Where do I get my basis for this? The, the, the problem is there isn't a lot written. There, isn't, there aren't a lot of imagery, uh, or there's not a lot of imagery that is out there, um, not com compared to other Slavic groups. There's other Slavic groups that there are, there's so much, there's so much, so many publications that are out there. We don't have as many, or we have not had as many. And unfortunately, well, pardon me, fortunately, there are more publications now. Those publications should have happened earlier, I think, because it would have preserved a lot more, and I think a lot more people would have been interested. And again, a lot of this research was then used by folklore groups, right, in order to reconstruct costumes, all right? Because many a times, if they didn't know, they'd make it up, right? And then, of course, with the ever-famous internet that we have, everything that we see on the internet is true, correct? So those fallacies sometimes just keep, just keep getting worse and worse and worse and worse, right? And that's why I think that I started Slavinska Lutskonosha as, as a site, because I found a lot of things that I was researching. There were just a lot of things out there. It was just like, okay, let's get something what I think is a little bit more correct. And I usually get a nod from people and they're like, yep, this is the right, you know, this is what we need to do. So um, there are watercolors that are out there. Be very careful on old watercolors because remember artists, artists like to be artistic and they like to put colors that don't necessarily happen, right? So we can't take them literally for 100%, it has to be this way, but we can see details though in those that we may not see otherwise. So today what I would like from you and those maybe that are online is to start looking at the start looking at the images not as a complete thing necessarily but start looking a little bit more at some details. There are things that you might notice really quickly and there may other things going oh my goodness I never saw that before or yeah you're right what is it let's zoom in that's the cool thing nowadays now we can zoom in right uh, a little word for you as well. If you have old black and whites, what I have found that if I actually take a photo with my cell of an old black and white, it makes it crisper. It makes it actually wow, right? And that opportunity came up um, with, a, with a family member when I was in Slovenia. I wanted, some, I wanted some of the old photos, right? And of course, I wasn't going to get it. And I just took photos and I thought, she actually looked at them and said, you have better photos than the old photo, right? And I can zoom in then too, which is really good for the old generation because they're like, I can't see a face. And then you zoom in going, oh, I know who that is, right? So uh, old photographs are still around. Collections in museums, um, it all depends on what museum you go to in Slovenia. Uh, I have been noted very well by the Slovenske Ethnografske Muse as being very uh, critical of them. Yes. Right, the amount of things that they have would blow our minds. Uh, publications coming out, we hope. Do we have access to it? No. Even researchers have very hard time getting access. And I get it, it's a museum. But why hold on to it if you're not going to spread the information? So if you know what a pecha is, a white pecha, they have over a thousand pecha in their depot. And I keep saying, so when's the publication coming up? Right? I think you just need to know that people are interested in it, right? Because again, other nationalities, as I see it, are, are pretty good at sharing that type of information. I get it, not everybody should be touchy feely with everything, right? But there are certain people that are doing reconstructions that way. Uh, misconceptions, every region has one variation. Uh, no, okay? You can see in, in Bela Kraina, we have variations, and some variations nobody really does. 
And you're like, oh, I never knew about that. Or it's like, wow, that's not what I thought Bella Karina was all about. I mean, this goes with other regions. Um, Sub-borders amongst the costumes. Just because there's a border on a map doesn't mean that what people wore across isn't exactly the same or very similar. Look across borders. You see this in Bela Karina as well. All right, I was speaking with, uh, with a friend about uh, the parish in Steelton, Pennsylvania. Um, that was actually founded by Croatians and Slovenians who were on either side of the Kolpa, right? It's Belo Krajnci, right? They called them you know, Krajnci, right? And those from Pokoplje, which is the other side. The dialects were, I'm not saying they're the same, but they're similar, right? And the dress, or what the women wore, in particular what men wore, very similar, right? But we as Slovenians are very used to what is known as Narodonosha. The Narodonosha was actually created to make us look completely different than our neighbors. All Narodonosha were done that way, right? So they added and subtracted certain things so we would not look like that we were Austrian, Italian, Croatian, Hungarian. We looked different, all right? So we have a lot of influences that way, but here we go. Let's hope for the best. So some of the uh, criteria of really quick, um, Regional prosperity. I'm going to tell you that some of these regions that I'm going to talk about today we are, were not necessarily the richest regions around. All right. There was a lot of poverty. All right. And that is widespread throughout most of the country. But this was poverty. This was very uh, farm based families. All right. Um, and again, multiple children. Right. A lot going on. Uh, working conditions. You needed to work in order to keep. Keep, keep living right? in order to survive. Uh, social status, of course, we have different social statuses. Middle class, uh, very, very few. Industrial and wealthy, few, if any, in these, in these areas. Uh, connections amongst the villages and the regions. So you, it'd be ironic because when we start seeing some of these regions, you're going to be like, well, they're so far apart, but hey, they're wearing the same type of things. Ironically speaking, most of Slovenia wore linens at one time. That goes for all the regions I'm not going to talk about, including Borenska. The oldest costumes are all linen. All right. Um, the time and the calendar, the season, all depending on what you wore. Just like now, right? It's a little cold. We put up a jacket. We put up a coat. Right? Today, by the way, is a beautiful, I call Canadian, Canadian Saturday because it's zero degrees, sorry, zero Celsius and 32 for you. And it's sunny. My wife already said, I'm going to pull up a chair at the hotel. I'm going outside. I'm going to bathe in the sun. Right? We're waiting for it. Right? But again, when it's cold, right? What did people wear? One thing that men always wore, always wore a hat. There was always a hat involved. Women would always wear a kerchief, except for girls. Nowadays, you wear whatever you want. But there was a social status of what you needed to do. All right? Uh, family life, work, you wore certain clothes. Church, you're not wearing work, clo work clothes to church, right? The endless debate, do you wear jeans to mass? My mother would say, there's no way you're wearing jeans. That is considered work, like even to this day. But again, there was a status of what you wore. Sunday best and festive were put in the closet for only then. After church, you changed. And that Sunday best last, lasted your entire life. A woman got married in a certain dress. That dress was your Sunday best. So her wedding dress was not white, right? Sunday best, and it was put away. Festive time, everyday life, national pride. Okay, so the establishments of folklore groups actually helped to preserve a lot, all right? And, um, and goodness knows without, that, without those, I don't know where we would be. So there are a number of, of course, uh, masks that do is, exist. I just want to kind of acknowledge that because we have Kurentovania going on, right? So we have the, uh, uh, you know, we have the Kurent over there on the top very left. That's one of the oldest ones with a white mask. All right, um, and then we've got some that are down below. They look a lot different than the ones you're going to see tonight, right? Right, tonight now they're really robust. Then it was furs and things, then it was it. It was just about hiding yourself, right? Now, I don't know if you can see it quite well, but that's Zeleni Yure up on the very top, right? But that is from Starska. That's Jurczyk. That's not Yuri, that's Jurczyk, right? On the very right here, that's Zeleni Yuri from Bela Kraina, right? So Zeleni Yuri is not only found in one area. Again, there's no borders. People did various things. There was no TV. There was no internet, right? 
People, people had this idea of the idea of magic and religion and all of that, right? So on the very left-hand side, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pozovacin. All right, very left-hand side. A Pozovacin is quite interesting because a Pozovacin used to, and still to this day, it, 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 he kind of got resurrected now, are known in Prekmuri and Shtarska. And, and any, anybody know what a Pozovacin is used for? No? Okay. Sorry, I take it for granted. Um, sorry, uh, 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 let's go back. Sorry, sorry, that's me. Pozovacin is actually used. There's two of them. One represents the bride and one represents the groom. They go from, they go to the houses of the people invited to the wedding. A few days before the wedding. They invite people to the wedding. And he has a whole script of what he has to read, including a litur liturgical. He has to take his hat off. And he also does a lot of jokes and things of that nature. For instance, in his wine flask, he has wine, but he says that it's the bride's milk, and he offers that to people. But by the end, this poor individual, I don't know if this poor individual can walk anymore. All right? But that was that merriment, right? To this day, they still have a pose of a chin every so often for weddings. You could hear him going around because he has, he has not only a trumpet, but he also, uh, a type of trumpet, but he also has bells on. You can hear him, right? Uh, you have to stay away from him because on the on the end of his axe is a yezhuka, right? A hedgehog, and of course he runs after the young maidens or he runs after kids. And if he gets you, you're gonna feel it real real fast. All right. Um, the the two uh, the one at the very top um, are Vila, and then Kopiash, which is over on the very right hand side. Those are Shtar, uh, in Shtarska. And if you watched any of the merriment in Ptui and the Kurantovanya, they were out this morning already in the parade there. And the one, the, the lady that is there is Saint Lucy that goes around in, in Prekmuria. And unfortunately, yeah, she goes around and yeah, she scares kids. And she, she goes around with a plate and a knife and two eyeballs. <clears throat> yes, she scares the kids, you know, if you're not going to be, if, not, if you don't do your prayers. Right? So there are masks that are out there. There are traditions that are out there. Sometimes a little scary when you think about it. These are some of the oldest um, uh, imagery that you will find. The bottom two are Prikmuria and the top two are actually So if you look at, um, as, as someone who teaches design, I study landscape architecture. I try and look at it, it's just not costuming, it's how people live, it's the architecture, it's, it's, it's that religious thought, everything. These are all tied together. You have to kind of know a little bit about the pulse of it, right? To say that people who are not Slovenian um, could not get a good pulse would be incorrect, but I think if you are brought up with any of these traditions, it actually gives you a little bit more insight as to how things go, right? Bela Kraina, for some reason, you know, I think Bela Kraina, you're like, why are the buildings not all white? It's, it, Bela Kraina is known as the white region, right? And most people think that, that and there's, there's two reasons that, that they think they call it Bela Kraina, and one is because of the white costume, and the other is because it have white birch trees, that there's groves of white birch trees, which is correct, we don't know, all right? Anybody know what Prik Maria used to be known as? Before it was known as Prik Muria, which is over Mura. At one time, it was known as Slovenska Karina, Slovenian territory, because it was under Hungary at one time. All right. And again, the depictions. I talked to you about a little bit about depictions that are out there. So if you have an artist, same artist did the, the, the two on the very left. Again, you have to watch the art form, right? She's actually really good with detailing. All right. Like, again, she goes a little, little bit more boisterous in a lot of things. So this is actually uh, the one on the very left-hand side on the very top is Polyanska Dulina and Bela Kraina. It's a bride and a, um, and a flag bearer. They have flag bearers for weddings. All right. The ones in the middle are actually Prekmuria. Again, now look at, the, look at the man's pants. It almost looks like a skirt, right? It's so full. Now the question might be, is that the artist doing that? Or is that through the influences of Hungary? If you look at the Hungarian white costume, their pants are really wide, like I can literally lift it up, all right? And this lady right here is the artist's mom, Jopati Chopa, all right? She's actually wearing a traditional, she's wearing what is, was traditional for Bela Kraina. What is the oddity? Well, she's not wearing a white thing on her head, all right? Anyone else notice something on that? 
Maybe not. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, she's got yeah. It's she's got braids in that wrapped around her head for sure. There's embroidery here. All right, and you might not notice but there's actually lines going here too. Those lines are actually because it was a special type of fabric. Yeah, exactly. Right. Usually we look at her and go, yeah, my costume, we're good. Right. But when you start to understand a little bit about the costuming and maybe the cut and the materials, then you start going, ah, oh, there's more to it than I thought. All right. So the materials that are out there, I had to take a few out compared to last night. So this slide I used last night because of the fact that these are the types of natural materials that are used for costuming. Uh, the three that are there, the linen, the wool, and cotton are predominant for Pannonian costumes. All right. Ironically speaking, linen was a very cheap fabric, right? Most people could make that themselves. Um, what they would do is they would actually make the linen, they would actually sell it and buy cotton because they thought cotton was better, right? If they could afford it and if they could get it. Now, if anyone actually goes into a fabric store to look for linen, linen is one, it, linen is, may not be as pricey as silk, but it, it probably could be because linen right now, a yard or a meter, can be absolutely outrageous if you can find it. And at one time, they couldn't give it away, right? All right, so three different types of costuming for Slovenia, right? Dr. Makarovic uh, mentioned this, and she mentions it through her books. I know a few of you actually have her book, Slovenska Lutska Nosha. Um, it's a red book, and on the back, it's got patterns for it. I'm gonna tell you, it's a really, if you can find it, it's a gold mine. Um, hard to find nowadays because there weren't too many of them made, but the patterns at the back can actually help you do some reconstruction. So the Pannonian type, there's Mediterranean and there's Alpine. You're familiar with the Alpine one, probably the most. And some of you are familiar with the Pannonian one. Maybe not as much with the Mediterranean one. All right. So we're going to talk about this one. And these are the regions we're going to try and talk about. Okay. So Poravia, Prekmurje, East and Southern Štarska, Southern Dolenska, Bela Krajina, and then something called Kostel. And some of you, I don't know if you even know what that is. I'm going to tell you, I had no idea where Costel was until a dance group was formed there, and then they had a publication. And if you ever hear or you go online and type in Prifalski Musicanti, Prifalski Musicanti are probably some of the most popular ethno music in Slovenia. And I will tell you that they all started with the folklore group in Costel, or in Fara, pardon me. And it was because of them that the costume was researched. All right, what do we got? So the similarities for all of the Pannonian is the following. You will find that there is a gathered skirt for a woman in true Pannonian form on a belt. That is on, a, on the same type of fabric. Okay, so don't think of a belt as being leather, all right? Everything is gathered on that belt and tied at the front. I was going to say, same as my pants, but I'm not going to show you. All right. All right. But that is what is considered to be the true Pannonian type of costume. All right. Um, later, a bodice was put on top. And when a bodice is put on top, that's considered then to be alpine. Right? Because that's right. Because now it's, it sits on you and you don't have to worry about the weight around your waist because now it's actually on your shoulders and it's pushing down. Right? Some of you, I believe, call those jumpers. Right? Like where you, where you have a, right? That type. Uh, a petticoat underneath. Right? How many petticoats? Depends on where you are and how rich you were. How wide did you want yourself to, to be? Right? Yes, ladies, they wanted, you wanted to look wider. Nowadays, who does that? Right? Okay. Many petticoats in white and then eventually colored petticoats did come into, into fashion as well. Uh, a blouse of some type. A kochamaika. Kochamaika is actually a top that is, is, is a blouse itself in a different fabric. So it's rarely done, in, it's never done in white. And it almost just kind of looks like an overcoat and then it's on, on, the very, on the very top. I have, actually have one here and I can kind of show you exactly what that looks like as well. Sometimes there's an overcoat that goes about all, all of it, usually fur. So the fur is on the inside. Think of the Kudens jacket inside out. That's what they wore in the winter, right? So the wool fleece is on the inside. The outside, you actually see the leather part. And then they embroidered that possibly. Okay. Uh, an apron. Duino. For sure. 
sometimes two, right? One on top of the other, okay? Without an apron, I think that was even up to our grandmother's generation, aprons were mandatory, right? Um, headwear, always, women always covered their heads, right? Girls were a different story until, uh, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to this as more for Gorensko, right? Um, when a woman got married in Gorensko, they always say, she went underneath the alba, right? Ironically, the alba that we may know from the Alpine region uh, is a category, and you're going to see some of those alba different styles here. You're going to be like, that doesn't look like one but it's still under the same thing, right? So when women got married, you had to cover. In Bela Krai in particular, there's one thing that she wore uh, in, in some village, there's one thing she wore only for a week after she got married. It kind of represented, I just got married. And then after that week, she got rid of that. And I'll show you, that's called the Zagouts. All right, uh, footwear. Uh, a little question about that one. Footwear, maybe from us, maybe, right? Other than that, maybe barefoot. Until you went to church and you put them on when you walked into church, right? Do you know all footwear at one time were all right, right feet too? I don't know if you knew that. They weren't a right and a left foot. They were all right feet. And then we would switch them. Yeah, because there was only one model, right? Socks, maybe, maybe. Belts of some kind, possibly, right? And adornment. Now, adornment. <laughs> You know, nowadays we have, you know, the earrings and we've got the necklaces and that. Again, consider that these people could not afford that type of things, right? A dormant might be just a flower of any type, right? So with men, pants, linen, aka these, right? Or woolen tight ones. And those may have been influenced by... Uh, by military, right? There seems to be a little bit of influence because of that, but they were woolen, right? So those were done very much, um, they were unique. I'll show you an example or two of that. Linen shirts, ah, guess what? I don't have to tuck it in. These shirts do not go in my pants. These shirts are over my pants, all right? Possibly a belt. Nowadays we go for the largest belt, right? Oh, because you know, but belts could be very narrow. Belts could be woven belts because people could not afford them. Uh, an overcoat, possibly. Headwear, for sure. Footwear. Men would go barefoot, but if anyone was going to have footwear, it was going to be the man of the house. Not the children, for sure. Mom would get it next, and we'd go that way, right? And any adornment, all depended, right? Um, if you look there... Those are four different, re well, kind of regions. So the man on the very left is actually from Prekmuria, a, a sketching from Prekmuria. The one beside there is from Kuchewia. The one to the right of that is from Vinitsa in Bela Kraina. That's where the tight pants, the tighter pants, the two in the middle, right? And the one on the very right-hand side is from the area around uh, Boyansi. So Uskoki, people who came from the south. Right, historically came from the south. All right. So, here we go. Y'all set? Buckle up. Prekmuria, here we go. So, <laughs> with Prekmuria, some of you might have might, uh, been um, very familiar with what's over on the very left-hand side. Prekmuria is land of flats in some areas and hand, uh, land of hills in other areas. Prekmuria is divided into three areas. Those are Dolinsko, Ravensko, and Gorichko. Okay, um, there are a few dance or folk groups. One in particular in Belfast was very strong, okay, and actually influenced everything for what is kind of perceived around Uh Fields of wheat. If you go to Prekmuria, just fields and fields and fields and fields and fields, fruit basket, right? River, Mura beside. Unfortunately, Mlina Mura is gone. It got destroyed with the floods recently, all right? So is it a tourist spot? Not really. If you want some thermal spas, it's a really good place to go. If you want some really good home cooking, oh boy, all right? But um, there are very 
few photos. This photo is actually from the Ethnographic Museum in Budapest. Because again, that area at one time was under Hungarian rule, right? People couldn't speak Slovenian outside, right? They didn't speak Hungarian, right? And there's still a pretty sizable Hungarian population. Ironically, this area was really not studied for costuming or for clothing. Nor did they study the Hungarians in that area, which I find it quite odd. All right. So there's a lot of fallacies of what goes on in this area. So this is what the costume was, was or this is the costume that was created. And it was kind of created through the influences of Beltensin. Okay, so what are we going to do? What are we going to do different? Well, we know it's a white, and we're going this route, that route. So what they ended up doing is create. So if you look at the very top left hand side, those are individuals from the uh, Built into group, all right? You re realize the rich color, like the rich color of the, the top and the and so the women's top and, and the apron is corresponding. And then there's these flowers that were put on. Why? Because otherwise it looked boring according to the individual that I spoke to. Because yeah, we added something, right? So again, was that true to form? Mm, no, probably not. Okay. Um, and again, that became mainstream and widespread. So on the very right top picture is a group from Lindava. Okay, um, same idea, right? Same costume, right? Same thing. Ironically, my mom's in that picture of all things. Yeah. My mom is the second lady from the left. That's my mom. She's the one that got me into folklore, but that's another story. Anyways, she likes to say how I was like, yeah, I'm not going. And now look at me where I am. All right. On the very left bottom is a dance group from Ljubljana called Akademiska Folklorna Skupina Franca Marot. So Marot then took that and then, of course, added black lines to the skirt to make it that much even greater on, on staging. You've got to realize it's about staging and what does it look like? Is it flashy? If you're going to other countries, people want to see a little flash, right? It's really hard when you're competing with other nationalities that have like color and everything, right? And then they say, you know, a lot of, I, I had a lot of Slovenians say to me, yeah, but our stuff is boring. Well, don't make it boring. Make it that it's the best thing you've ever had. It's called attitude. How do you present it? You present it with awesomeness, people are going to pick that up like no problem, right? I go, you don't need to add the flash to make it great, right? That's not who we are, right? Be proud of what we've got. And on the right-hand side is basically uh, a group again, you know, polka dots came into fashion and everybody needed polka dots at the time, right? So what did we do in North America and outside of Slovenia? Everybody bought polka dotted cotton because that's what we saw. We didn't know, right? It even went to, in this case, Canada. This is actually a group that was in the early 60s uh, for the... Um, uh, the property is still under the organization of the club called Vicenni Zvon. And someone gifted me this, this image, sent me this image and said, my mom's in this one. I want you to know that there was this group. And then we had a huge talk about the history of this group, right? And this group was very vibrant, right? And, and very established for that time around that area. I think she said that she still has a costume from her, either her mom or hers. She goes, if you want, I can gift it to you. Right? Um, I mean, I've been getting a lot of these phone calls. What an old costume. Do you want it? Right? It's kind of cool. Um, and I'm glad they're still kind of kicking around. Uh, an old, uh, this is from Cerenciotti. So this is from Slovenia. Again, this is where people were trying to show their nationalism. Right? So again, the idea, you can tell there's a lot of variants going on here, right? Different sewing, sewing styles and who can do what and what. You realize that they're all a little different. And that's okay. Different is okay. Right? Do you have to have lines on dresses? No, nobody told you you had lines. I'm going to tell you the line is really not good. There's no reason for the line, right? Like lines and bands on a dress are there for a reason. They're adornment. Usually they were there for a reason because a woman had a dress, usually like one dress or like expensive dress. So usually if she was a younger girl and she grew, they just added more fabric and put the band on it to cover the seam. I remember saying that to somebody last year and she said, really, that's all? And I said, yeah. She said, you mean there doesn't have to be two lines? And I went, there doesn't have to be no lines. You could put 10 lines if you want. You put no lines. She goes, really? I went, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I remember that talk. I remember that talk last year quite well. Right? And then I said, who told you lines needed to be there? 
And she said, well, they're in all the pictures. And I said, ah, I don't believe pictures, right? Do you realize also the cut, right? They're starting to get like, okay, I, I don't want it to be, you know, it's taste. So we go from the old, and then we go into some reconstructions. So this is where people started to, these are, they spoke to older people to see what they would remember. And unfortunately, those people can't go that far back. Right? So the two on the very right hand side are also from Built and See. Those are, it's a young group called Marki. All right. And they actually did a whole thing to research the costuming as well. Right? Uh, there's a reason they're called Marki because anyone from that area around Built and See that at one time, they were, they were referred to as Marki. Right? And there's a, there's a few stories in regards to that. The oldest photo, I showed you that one already. All right. Most people look at that and say, uh, it's either Hungarian or Croatian. If you know Croatia, Croatian costumes, Croatia Nošnja, that really looks like Podravina, right? Which is not close at all, right? You realize the women are wearing boots in this one? A little higher up, ooh, a little risque on that, right? Because normally skirts were not that short. Uh, the, the picture on the very right-hand side is an over, is a jacket or an overcoat. It's actually an ethnographic museum. I'm dying for somebody to make that. Those are kind of, it's really cool, right? It's all woven, by the way. It's, all, it's a linen, it's a heavy linen, it's all woven that way with the colors inside of it. And that might be influences from other nationalities. And again, if it was a good weaver, the weaver just wanted to put red in it, right? That's how people kind of moved on to things. All right. These reconstructions kind of blew a lot of people's minds. So these are considered to be 18, like late 1800s, all right, early 19s. So um, a friend of mine, I hope she doesn't mind that I actually use her watercolors. So her watercolors are on the very right-hand side. She does watercolors, and she's also a seamstress. She likes to draw these things out before she does these things, right? So these are some of the things. And again, this is talking to a lot of people and then talking to some researchers. If you start looking at things, check out the one on the very bottom. It, it reminds you of the one in the museum, all right? The woman in this case actually has a top, but the top is more of a like modets, right? It's there to kind of hold things in position. It's, there's a reasoning for it. It's not just there as an adornment, right? It's not attached to anything, right? Um, and then a number of different variations were created for a group, um, I believe in Polana at that time. Um, I was fortunate enough to take every single couple. This was at a festival and I nabbed every single one of them. Can we, can we just take a photo? I'm gonna let you you know that that day of the festival is probably 35 degrees. So 35 Celsius is like way over the top 100, okay? And they are wearing these costumes, like, like overcoats and I was just like, I don't know how you do this, right? The things we do for folklore sometimes, right? And you realize the jackets on top of and all of that, this is what people wore. Okay, if you saw this earlier, you would have probably say, I, that's not even slated, right? Look at this gentleman right, well, this gentleman here and that one there. He actually has, like, look at the hat that he's wearing. A lot of people would say, whoa, what is that? That is completely different. That doesn't look like the hat that we are used to, right? Also, if you look at the gentleman there that up at the very top in the middle, you realize his shirt and his pants are both made out of linen. You realize there's a difference between the top one and the bottom one, right? One is probably a lot thicker. Could be made out of hemp and not out of flax. I've got a very old uh, pair of pants here that's hemp, right? I'm gonna tell you it's 1900s. Would I wear it? No, because it'll be the itchiest thing you ever wear and heavy, right? Perik Muria, Gaspari over on the very, Gaspari is on the right. That's his drawing on the very right hand side. Now this is where a belt came into play. Gaspari was actually really good because he worked at, actually at the museum. So he had access to things that other people didn't, right? So you realize that she now has a belt to put everything nicely together. And people then took that and started creating their own little variations of it. And I remember when this came out first, my mom looked at this and said, that is not Parikh I said, well, how can you say that? Because it didn't look like what I wore, right? So it, again, 
right? And I'm like, yeah, mom, but, you know, and then, you know, mom is mom, right? So you don't want to fight with mom too long, right, in regards to it. Is mom wrong? The thing is, what we remember or what we think is right, sometimes we can't alter that. There's some really nice, nice people in this, these pictures, let me tell you. The one thing that I do want to touch upon is that uh, a dance group did use these costumes to do wedding dances. So this is from some adults as well. Um, even though this tradition is still very, I'm not going to say is as widespread, and it's not only done in Pachamuria, the idea of using the woman's or the bride's crown all right, made out of wax, it's all wax. I have one, I just I didn't want to bring it because it's pretty fragile. All right. Um, those were normal at the time, right? Again, people had time, dedication, all that. There was no, you know, there's no TV. There's no internet, right? We don't swipe nowadays, right? There's no TikTok ding dongs, I call it, right? So that is one of the oldest costumes. That's a costume actually in the museum in um, in Nublana, okay? And then these are this is a reconstruction. So reconstruction in Beltancy. So there's embroidery on the bottom, okay? Not everybody had that. And then these are all reconstructions that were made because of research that was done. Realize that on the very right-hand side, um, the, the material that's actually used is a cotton. It's called druk, right? It's picots, though. It's got a lot of different, like, small little patterning. Patterning galore. And the red that is on there on the, is actually a petticoat. It's actually uh, a slip. Okay. What a fine couple on the bottom. You know, when, they when you tell them, can I take a photo and they pose for you? How can you not take a photo? <laughs> Some of the headwear as well. Um, uh, Putsu is, is actually was created in Pekmuria and it was actually put on the, on the back to keep the hair together. Okay. Many a times it was also made so it was a little bit larger. Sometimes it was tied under, rarely it was tied underneath. Usually it was put on the, on the, on the top and the very back. Because again, women had long braids and they made a bun and it kept it all together. And then it can get also get to the point where you can actually see the top or the, or, or the front of it, right? So that it, it would cover, right? We see other uh, ethnic groups where women are covered all the time. And we think, oh my goodness, uh, most Europeans were exactly the same in, in this case. Um, of course, the young lady that is in the middle is not wearing one because I couldn't find mine. And if she finds out that I actually have her in here, I'm going to be in deep trouble. She's a sweetheart. I couldn't resist putting her picture on there. So there's also another one made out of fabric. Okay. So as you notice, the one on the very right-hand side, again, to keep it all together. And then everything was covered with a white kerchief or a kerchief, usually a white one. And I don't know if you can see from that, but the embroidery is there, but there's not a lot. It is not lavish, right? Usually the edges are scalloped, and it's all with, with white, white threads. Usually only white threads. If red was put in, in this case, it was probably because she was of um, Hungarian background. Any questions from Prekmuria? We're good? All right. The one thing I want, I just added this uh, when I got here. There are some problems. Uh, well, I shouldn't say problems. There are some um, things that we don't know about. So there were a number of these jackets, the one on the very, okay, all of these are reconstructions, but they're the, uh, the ones that are in Maribor right now. I think there's about two or three of them. They were actually found in the archive. And they said this is from the area, Prekmuria uh, and Guricko, so the hilly area. Um, so the, a group uh, in Maribor started saying, oh, we're going to get it from Guricko, and this is what we're going to wear. So they made these beautiful jackets, and they're great. But the thing is, who wore them? And were they Slovenian? And when did they wear them? Right? So speaking even to, to the individuals that saw them, great individuals. And I know that they're thinking oh, only positive in what, why they're doing it. But the question is, if you don't know the background, what are you perpetuating? Now you see on the internet going, Everybody's got to do this, right? Give a little bit more of a background of it, because the question I said is, was this a Slovenian household or a Croatian household? Uh, pardon me, a Hungarian household. Uh, oh, I don't know. Ooh, okay. Um, but we like it because it's different. It's vibrant. It's colorful, right? And then you get into a lot of the detailing. 
in regards to that. I just wanted to show you that because you can actually see this, right? Porabia are a number of villages that are, even though they're kind of associated with Prekmuria, they are in Hungary, all right? They were not annexed um, in, in 1918, all right? They remain there, and there still is a Slovenian minority community there. They've got some Slovenian um, uh, businesses and that. It's a real cool place to go. Um, and they also did some reconstructions. And these reconstructions are very, again, very similar to, to Prekmuria. I'm going to say, if not absolutely identical, all right? But again, you start getting little variances of, right? You see a gentleman here that doesn't have a jacket on or a vest of anything, right? Different colors, whites, linen galore, all right? Not very well known, but wanted to show you that one. And these are some of the watercolors that were done for Porabia. Again, these are more later versions that are out there. No publication was done. Uh, these were all in their cultural center. I asked if I could take photos, and they took all the photos down and said, you just take photos galore if you want. There are people that are very, very helpful. I think it's the approach and why do you want them, right? There are people that will go out of their way for you. Next is uh, Shtarska. All right. Working clothes. Do you realize they're not wearing aprons? All right. My, my grandfather was a Shtarska, God rest his soul. He wore an apron all the time. That's called a schutz, right? And if you had to, you put it up here and you buckle it over on the, on the side. Why? It was working, right? You're not going to get your pants dirty. Get that dirty, right? I don't know if any of you have ever harvested anything in a field in this, in this way. Interesting. All right. So the earliest shtariska. Here we go. Linen. Probably have never seen something like this before, right? Again, an artist rendition, different lines, different colors. And people started to construct them, which is really cool. Most dance groups want something or wanted something that's different than other groups, right? You want something different, a little flashy, something different that nobody else has. And those are all reconstructions. Check out the jackets again, I, you know. Fairly good reconstructions, all right? And there are various groups. Uh, the group uh, predominantly in there is from a village called Bucitovci, which is on the Shtarska side near Mura. Okay, and they're the ones that spearheaded um, a lot of trying to find a lot of older things. Um, my grandfather was, was from around there. So when I called them up, because they had a publication, I called them up, you know, just kind of out of the blue, said, I heard you have a publication. Oh, you want to get one? I said, yeah. I said, I came from Canada. And, this, and why do you want one? And then I said, we'll chat. And then when I said, my grandfather's roots are from around here, oh, I was a local boy after that, right? I think it's, again, it's that approach, right? So again, just a few more like visual eye candy, maybe, right? A lot different. And then you get into working costumes. These are a lot closer to now, right? Like 19, you know, I'm going to say 1930s, 40s, right? Even before that, maybe a little bit more. Again, skirt on a belt, blouse. Right? Still the idea is there, just different fabrics that are there. This is very, uh, they don't know, this is very work related. And this, and then eventually Shtaraska became what is known as more alpine, all right? Women's clothes then changed a lot. Uh, so did men. This is actually uh, showing a depiction of a wedding. And then these are things that you may actually see now. So I think Lansomovas is in there. So around the areas of Ptuit, ar around there as well. That's not necessarily completely Pannonian, but it gives you an idea, all right? And these are some variations as well. Like, look at the middle picture, like, you know? You know, not real love, but when you do, when you do staging and, you know, you got people, man, I think it's a great picture. By the way, the two on the very right-hand side are really good friends of mine. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's actually a tailor, and she's a seamstress. They sew a lot. Uh, in the region of Markozzi, so Markozzi as well, uh, I'm not going to say that they're formerly Pannonian. They also created white costumes, like I showed you before, all right? 
And then they also created something that was newer, and I wanted to show, uh, show you newer. Now again, this is where the tops and the bottoms now are attached. So this is more alpine in style. Um, and there's a lot of pictures floating around on the internet of this group, because again, they're, they're highly active now. And a group um, from Verge. Again, there are people that are still trying to commit to producing uh, or reconstructing old photos. They take a lot of old photos and they really analyze it. And then they try and make it to the best of their ability. I mean, thumbs up on that, right? And again, Ansubavas, realize she's wearing a blouse and a skirt, ah, right? The ID, the Alpine is still there. Oh, pardon me, the Pannonian is still there. And if you have old photos like this, scan them and send them to me. I think these are amazing. If you have the history behind that, even better. And a lot of people got rid of these things. They, oh, we don't need these old. We don't need these old pictures. For people who do reconstructions in that, this is this is gold, right? This is really gold. Some of you, so look what the ladies are wearing. Some of you might be familiar with that type of uvuta. It's malapeta, right? Robets. So it's many robets, but it's not real svila. It's not real silk. Um, most, most women wore white, white embroidery. Now, I did a little bit of reading in this book, and I got to do a little bit of investigative work but apparently most of the ones that are up there are, um, I might be related to the lady, which is really cool, because when I saw the last name, I was like, wait a minute. So I'm gonna do a little bit of investigative work uh, in regards to it. And a lot of people threw these things out. Here's the ironic thing. A lot of people use these for um, a religious party, right? They would put like a, right? But before they used to be worn by women uh, as a kerchief. Right? They just like the embroidery. Anybody see those? So these are the silk silk ones. They're not actually like they're kind of like not real silk. These were widespread at one time throughout various parts of Slovenia, including Pannonian. You'll find these down in Croatia as well. All right. Um, there's still there's a lot of them. I've got two of them actually over in the back as well. If you want to take a gander at them. Uh, a group from a teacher, uh, so around Bizelsko, Salstarska, took watercolors and created that. Can you imagine that coming on stage and saying it's Slovenian? You're like, I've never seen that in my life, right? This actually has some influences from Dolenska, and that you're kind of familiar with a few things, right? Check those out, right? I mean, I could show one thing, we can start analyzing every single picture in regards to it. All right. If I'm going to talk about Dolenska, I'm going to have to talk about Kuchevia. And in Kuchevia, um, around Kuchevia before the Second World War was a huge population of German-speaking people. Okay? Um, they actually created a lot of woolen fabric that most people bought from. Okay? Unfortunately, after the war, they were all displaced. Right, and we'll leave it at that. Um, just, I'm going to say fairly recently, in about 25-ish years, maybe a little bit more than that, a publication came out to try and reconstruct these costumes. So the question now is, is this considered a Slovenian costume or is this considered a German costume? Well, because it's from Kuchelia, did Slovenians around Kuchelia wear these as well? More than likely is. Okay, so when you look at this, look at the gentleman on the very right-hand side is actually wearing a pair of trousers, like a pants that are actually woolen. You'll see these pants in, uh, very rarely in Pekmuri, but also in Belakraina, all right? And you'll actually see them in other nationalities. You'll see this in Croatia, and you'll see this in Slovakia as well, right? You'll, right, in Poland, right? And the women, uh, so there's actually some watercolors that were created, that watercolor is there. And then, again, with the spur of nationalism, people started creating these types of things, right? There were a lot of parades in Ljubljana, they had a huge thing about you know, Slovenia is all coming together in their national garb, and then even going to Vienna, right? When the Archduke actually had a, a huge thing, right? They wanted to show who they were. Right? 
There's actually a dance group now in, uh, I think, around Puchelia that actually does these things, right? Uh, that actually wears these costumes. They actually have greenish tops to it. I don't know if that's really, uh, green's not a plain in color, right? But again, um, it's hard when things are black and white, right? Or again, an artist. An artist might have used like light blue or green, and everybody goes, it's got to be blue, blue or green. But they may have wanted to do that as a, as a shadow. All right. And again, there's Kuchelia. Wanted to make sure that I made reference to it. Okay. This is what you want. A lot of people are going to talk about Bela, Bela Nosha, Bela Kraina. All right. So what we're going to talk about are different, different villages and different areas here. There's one Bela Kraina Kenosha. We have, a, we have a lady here who has a Bela Kraina Kenosha and a Bela Kraina Kenosha there. Correct? All right. I'm going to tell you there's two different styles of Bela Kraina Kenosha. Actually, there's more than two. Um, there's more than two. All right, but we're going to have to categorize them slightly. All right, so the areas here is Kostel and then Stari Terk, Dragatush, Vinitsa, Adlishichi, Chernomle, and Metlika. And then I've got a circle there, and those are where Uskoki, people say that they're from Uskoki, so people from down the south, they still are Orthodox, right? Orthodox religion. And they actually have a costume that is very much from a. Uh, from, looks very similar to the region of Lika in Croatia. All right? Beautiful, by the way, just let me see it. When I tell a uh, Slovenian group not to wear that, dang, yeah, sure, sure, beautiful. All right, so, Costel. I had no idea where Costel was until this book was given to me. This was a book that was given to me many, many, many years ago. All right? Um, unfortunately, out of publication, I don't even know if you can find it. And then this picture, Gaspari did this picture right here. Do you realize she's wearing this pitch on her head? It doesn't even look tight. It looks like goat horns is what they said, right? Goziru, yeah? Right? Just tied that way. Did they wear that? Yeah, sure they did. Okay. The ironic thing too is when you look at it, I don't know if you can actually see, even through some detailing, there's lines here. So what do those fit? Why is the apron so thin? The apron is narrow. It's the span of your hand. It's not wide. Okay, so a group um, in Fada actually decided to bring the youth together. We're going to learn how to play music from there. And nobody knew how to play tambura. And then they realized, oh, the traditional music's not just tambura. We can actually add an accordion and maybe even a violin in there. And then from that, when the group unfortunately did fall apart, the musicians continued on and they're known as Prifati Musicanti. All right, um, various details here. Embroidery in, I'm told it's brown, but I think it's black that's washed out. Okay, and in a certain style. That's a real picture on the very top left with her, like, you know. All right, and reconstructions that are done. That's different, eh? And even the blouse themselves looks like she has, like, there's a collar, right? If you look here, there's a collar, right? And there's no buttons. There's a pin that the adornment that, that keeps it all together up here. All right? Very narrow. If anybody wants the pattern, I got it for you. I dare you. Um, a group of ladies from Costel were so gracious. We we're going back and forth with an email, and then I got bombarded with about 20 photos of a pecha, which right here is probably one of the most elaborate things I have seen. This is last year. I saw some elaborate ones in Cleveland last year. This, they're like, what do you need? Do you want me to measure? They measured it. They did it all. I can't wait to go to Slovenia. I'm going to go to Costel just to see these ladies. It's going to be a bit of, a, a bit of an excursion, all right? The, um, the apron is very narrow, as you, can t as you can tell. And of course, okay, Zvonka in the middle is not wearing a costume. She's just wearing an uh, overcoat in this case. Zvonka is instrumental for that, for that area. And Zvonka is from Shkofiloka. Zvonka I knew when I was in Marot. Zvonka played tambura. And nobody wanted to go to Kustel to or Fara to teach them tambura because it's too far away. She said, I'll do it. She taught them how to play tambura. And she, I would say, without her, that group would not have been established. Uh, she got the whole entire costume 
brought to her house one day. I have a relative right near Skopjeloka. She said, come over, I got something to show you. So I took a lot of pictures. I'm gonna tell you, that was a long time ago. A long time ago, all right? And now we'll go to Bela Kraina. All right. There are depictions and images that are out there for Bela Kraina. All right. Some of them are staged. All right. They're not necessarily correct. So the lady that is on the very right hand side is considered to be a bride. And some of the clothes that she wears is actually from the originally from the from the ethnographic museum. Um, there were some directors that were there that were really trying to promote all of this. So they put things together. Sometimes they put things that we question. So um, she's got a, a corona for a ride um, on top. And again, it's black and white. So we're not quite sure. You know, well, we know what colors they actually are. But the one thing that she's actually wearing around her waist is actually a shawl. So I actually inquired about that shawl because, again, in Croatia, in Prigori, Women wear a shawl over their apron. I said, is that influential in Bela Kraina? He goes, so the people that I was talking to, they said, well, we think it was just added for color. But we don't know. So now it's like, do we do it? Don't we do it? For someone who might do staging, I'd be like, yeah, I'll put one or two on. Why not? Who's going to know? Right? This is an old image. Check out the various costumes or check out the various clothing. These poor children, right? These poor kids, the things we do, right? For, wear this nosha, please, to mass and sit still and be nice. Don't you gum. No, you can't wear running shoes, right? They actually went to Vienna to display who they were. You realize that even the girls that are there are wearing various types of clothing, all right? From different areas. The little girl that over there, all in the dark, is from like Boyansi, right? So from that Uskoki area, right? So if you're familiar with Poliansko Dulina, which is close to, to, close to Shkofiloka, do you know there's a Poliansko Dulina in uh, Belakrana? All right, there is. So uh, along Kolpa. Um, actually, I have a very good friend whose mom was from Sari Turk. Right? And I would never have known she was from Bela Kraina because she spoke Slova proper Slovenian so well that I had no idea she was a Bela Kraina. Ever. Not that that would have mattered. Right? And when I told her I was in Stadi Turk, she looked at she was, you were not. I said, oh yeah, I described where I was. I was there for when the book came out. So that book it exists that actually shows all the reconstruction. Some of the, some of the pictures are from there and, 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 and what have you. But if you notice, uh, there's actually a watercolor that was actually done. Uh, it's here, it says it's from Dole. So the question is, is it in Dolenska, Bela Kraina? But, all right. So when you look at this, it's considered a bride, a, a woman, and then a zastar, which, of course, a flag. Flag, right? So you see it's blue? So most people go, oh, my God, it's got to be blue. No, it's not. It's got to be white. Right? That's just an artistic version of it. But do you notice the lines that are on, her, on, her, um, on, on the women? All right? It's like, oh, okay, is that shadow? No, it was actually a, a, a cotton material called the valles, which was actually ribbed. Right? Can you find Valles now? No. Right? But you can, if you find a two-tone, right? if you want to reconstruct, you get the same effect. Most people won't go that. They'll just do linen. Who cares? Right? But if you want to go into that type of detailing, you definitely can. All right? Um, the women's blouses are short. They don't get tucked in. They're very short, right, in this case. And a lot of adornment. Now, the question might be, you know, what are they wearing? Um, you know, when it comes to that, again, is that true or not? He's wearing a white shawl around his, around his collar. Is that something that, I'm going to tell you, though, the red shawl around, around here is actually a form of folklorism. It makes it just to brighten up, right? Was it, men sometimes put a shawl or something around there, right, or a ribbon, but it doesn't have to be, well, you know, it, it does not have to be red for sure. Okay, uh, left-hand side, uh, even in the very top. The one thing that I want to tell you about the socks are they're actually uh, striped. It, that's kind of cool, all right? But also the, the skirt itself, even though it looks like there's little just gray waves, they used to do something called krishpanya, 
All right, in this case, so they used to wash the skirt, right? And then as it was drying and it was um, still moist, they would literally beat it against a rock, and then it would gather, right? And what they used to do is they used to, they used to make it so it would be ribbed on the bottom through that process, right? And that Krishpanya is well known for that area. So when you look at anyone that might be doing this region, you're like, well, they didn't, they didn't iron their costumes. That's what they're trying to show is the Krishpanya on the bottom of it. Some detail. If you're interested in this one, I got a pattern for this one too. All right, the blouse is a lot different. Now, if you look at the blouse, this is where it's tapered. If you realize that the, where, where the sleeves are, they're tapered with valas, and then at the ends they could actually have black material or velvet. All right, and there's a collar that goes on the back. Quite different. That's not what we know. And also, if um, oh, the young lady doesn't have it here. Oh, it did, I thought I would have showed it. All right, but here on the very bottom side, they used to have a very wide belt. So remember how she has a very narrow, like she's got a small blouse? That belt goes across, wraps around, and then at the very back, so the bile rip, it had a tail with all of these woolen things that right, it held everything down. Okay, a lot different again. Again, so that's Polyanska. Different variations of the bride and groom. Artistics. Can you imagine a poor young lady? Uh, you're getting married. You have to wear this. <laughs> but right, it was festive, right? She even has little mirrors in there and, and things, right? It's like, you know, if I tell my daughter, can you wear this? I'm not wearing that, all right? Then we get into, of course, Bella Clara that we might know a little bit better, all right? You're familiar with this. We have a great example up here, okay? So talk about the two, I'm gonna say larger towns, Bitlika and Chernomle, Chernomel. All right, um, and around there, this is where there's a lot of, we're not quite sure what's going, a lot of fallacies on, on how this costume is actually created. I'm gonna tell you that the true, I'm gonna say the true costume for Bela Karan is this. Nice, simple, check out his belt. It's not huge, right? All white, come on, Dave, all white. We want some color, all right? But there are a lot of different ways of doing things, so. You tied yours like that, all right? So that's a young lady, right? That's depicting from Chernomel, right? Chernomel, I say Chernomel, right? Um, but again, it's Naplamen, so it's a flame. Uh, Chakai, Daya Plamen, Daya Padrugustva. Type Zajk. Yes. All right. This is Mitlika. Question is, did women do this? Can you imagine walking around doing work like that? Or even going to church like that? You think so, eh? Yeah. I think you and I could have a really good drink and a beer, and we could have a really good debate over that. A lot of it was, how can we make the two groups look different on stage? Now, is it correct or not is a good debate, right? But that's not easy to do, right? When, when you're tying it and trying to keep it up and all of that, right? I remember tying like eight girls at one, you know, before they get on stage, right? The one that's over with the silver is from Zumbarak. That's in Croatia, Croatian, right? But it, there's a lot of them in the Metlika Museum. Metlishko, same costume. Now, this costume is usually made out of damast, like a cotton that has a pattern in it, not linen, all right? Her sleeves are different too, they're tapered. They're more fitted that way. Question is, do you have your, is your blouse longer on the front? But it's shorter on the back? Okay. The question is why did women do that? And is this right? Right? Well, that's all we know nowadays, so we're going with it, right? Also, the fact that the aprons are ironed, 
right, into pleats. Question is, is that correct or is that folklorism? It's folklorism, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows Pozemer, which is really near, is close to Mitlika. This costume, a lot of people are doing this one now. All right, very close to Mitlika. Um, a lot of detail with black. Same cut, same thing except linen. All right, look at the embroidery. You're, uh, if you've got good eyesight, this is really good for you. But uh, all right, um, this is the pattern for the blouse. And then some embroidery. And a different head covering. Go figure, right? Keep the hair together. All right at the back. This is a form of alba. Can you imagine somebody walking out going, what are you wearing? So we did a reconstruction. So the one on the very left-hand side is from the actual book. I did a little bit of uh, reading about what the descriptor was. And then we actually created one in Hamilton, OK, um, uh, in, in regards to it with, with the young seamstress. You know, that it was, an interesting, it was an interesting conversation of what I wanted and how I wanted it. She did it. I think she did a pretty smashing job in regards to that. So again, different form of tying. I think, the, uh, I think the picture on the very left-hand side was the only picture that was depicted for Slovenians in a book of Yugoslav costumes. That was the only picture that they put in, was that one. This is the embroidery for Chernobyl, red and blue. Same pattern. Now, a group from uh, Dragatush is very influential. They're kind of in the middle of Bela Kraina. Um, they're very active. They didn't get much information, but, they, uh, but around the parts in, in Tachna, um, Tanchagora, they found a, uh, a lady actually described perfectly what she remembered. And if you look at just the depiction of the, the drawing on the very right-hand side, there are some details there that you can kind of not really notice, okay? So her apron is gathered on the bottom. Do you also notice that on the, on the skirt itself, she actually has some kind of embroidery or something? It's actually lace and, and pleats, all right? So they created these. Also uh, on the apron, on one side, you can actually have her initials or flowers in like uh, cross stitch, right? Um, AM is a, is a colleague of mine who actually made these costumes. Uh, Anita Markovic. They, they begged me for, uh, I wanted a picture and they said only if you're in it, so there we go. Um, so they are from Dragatush. It looks simple, right? Uh, two publications that are probably still quite available. The one on the very left hand side, is, well, they're both Bela Kraina. All right, the one on the right um, is a double, and that means uh, two different, two different like various ones. And the one on the very left-hand side is along the uh, kolpa. All right, so Vinitsa Adlishichi, for instance. All right, um, and this is what we get for this. You're familiar with the top of the, with the, now in this case, for Bela Karina, the men's shirt is longer. Generally speaking, it's in, all right? Uh, the pants are exactly the same. Fairly easy to make. But we also have the tight pants, and we also have jackets, or we also have vests that are, are, are kind of a little bit different. And with the women, of course, we've got various other things that can be added to it. So these old photos exist. These are great. All right, this is actually Krasnitsa. They used to go for St. John's. They used to go around to every single house, and they used to sing for the Dobroleto. Right? Um, ironically speaking, look at this. Look at the length of the skirt. Right? You don't see that nowadays because now the length of the skirt is a lot shorter. And one of the reasons is they used to get old costumes. And of course, people grow taller, right? I have a son who's six foot four. Shockingly, eh? I'm nowhere close to six foot four. Younger generations are sometimes taller. So of course, like, these skirts get taller and taller. Because, oh, so the skirt only goes up to your knees, right? No, it should, I mean, you know, much, lo much, much longer. Aren't they all happy? <laughs> Do you realize even the girls are covered? 
right with their head. These are depictions of a wedding. The one unique thing that you might notice in the top uh, left and the bottom left is that there is, oh, he's here too, bagpipes, Gaida. What do you mean they don't play just tambura? I don't know. I love the picture on the very left hand side. I think they're just absolutely great. All right. So the detailing of this, this is from Vinitsa. So the detailing for this is all, uh, there's, there's called Stepanye uh, in, the, in this case. It's all the way the threads are done, and, and, and right? So it's very simple in its execution. All right. All linen. And so the group from Vinitsa, what they ended up doing is actually gathering material from old homes, from old houses. A lot of people had old linen that they, were get, that they didn't use for anything. So they use them to actually create the costumes for the dance group. Right? They revitalized a lot of that, that thing, right? or a, a lot of the older things. So this is the group that's there. I had to put a colo shot because, of course, you know, a lot of people think Bella Kana, they think of colo. That is the pizza costume in the museum. Check how short that is, right? That lady must have been small. At reconstruction. I believe, even though this is Franza model dancing, I think these are all costumes from Vinica. Um, they borrowed them, right? And if you look at all of the pieces, they're all different linens, right? They don't have, they don't have to be the same white in this case. And this is just some. So the embroidery is done in blue. The embroidery can be done in blue and red. The embroidery can also be done in gold or in black. Those were the major colors. But don't mix blue, red, yellow, and black all together. Right? It, and it, the threads all depended on where she was from, too. Um, a village called Preloka. All right. Um, there was actually a group there. The uniqueness here is that even though you can still do that embroidery, this is actually all somebody was really artistic when, you know, she knew what she was doing when it came to that. Uh, this is actually an homage to, we actually have a few Bello Kreinzi in Hamilton. All right. Um, some still living great and, and some that have passed away. And there are three Bello Kreinzi that are from three different, three different villages and all three were active in folklore groups. And it's funny when we talk to them, they go, Miss Monita Kodelal. Right, or we didn't say it that way. So we had Mr. Pavlak, which was from Preloka, who passed away. Um, and then we have uh, Christina, who lives in Kitchener, actually from Vinica. She met her husband in the dance group, and there you go. Um, and then Mr. Meisel, actually from Medlika. Right? And when we made Medlishka, he actually helped a lot in, in, in us um, trying to get that correct. As, or as correct as possible. The reason also I wanted to show you this is because the skirt started getting uh, higher. So this is from Preloka. Um, if you notice, that is actually a, a, an actual photo. Skirts got higher and women started getting into colored aprons. So the colored apron over on the right hand side, you started getting a little bit more detailed with different types of adornment and how they did that one, okay? Um, I'm gonna be, li I'll, I'll lie to you if I told you that this was a Slovenian lady. This is actually, this is actually Christian, right? Again, from the other side, exactly the same, right? Adlashichi, now, uh, there are some absolute awesome people in Adlashichi that actually still make linen, all right? And what they ended up doing is they wanted to make their costume completely different, right? Uh, so they didn't like the simple embroidery. They wanted to do things a little bit different. So they took, these are all original, like, photos of people wearing clothing. Right? The lady there is weaving a belt, right? using the tree as support. The lady's on the very right hand side. Breaking flex. Breaking flex, exactly. So this is what she did. She added this type of embroidery to it because they wanted it to be different. It's ironic because Adla Shichi is going, getting away from this and not using these anywhere. Right? But I wanted to refer to that Oh, and I put the knot up there. There go figure. Okay. Check out short. Okay. Boyancy came out with a, so this book is actually, I believe, still this online. So this is for uh, 
uh, Uskoki, right? So people from down south that still kind of um, associate themselves with that. They're usually Orthodox or a religion, right? So their their um, garb, especially for men, is generally the same. Okay, the one on the very right hand side, Sasha's wearing. I mean, they created. So they, the group from Vinitsa made a lot of different costumes. Right? You can tell how different they are, right? You've got that apron that is heavy and woolen. Some of the pictures that are there. A lot of adornment, right? The old dowry, right? The old coins. There's the skirt. Imagine wearing that apron. Heavy, all right? But a lot, a lot of detail. That's all embroidered, uh, pardon me, that's all uh, woven. That's all woven. So, some extras for men. Uh, I remember seeing a group like that and people going, what are they doing? That's not allowed, right? Again, stereotypes. And I think we had a little bit of talk about the belts, right? Earlier, like earlier uh, this afternoon, right? Um, belts created. Um, these were all done by that gentleman right there for the group from Vinitsa, and his wife teaches them, so he knew how to do it. Unfortunately, the case is when you have a little bit of talent, sometimes then you have to do it all, right? Don't tell people what you know how to do, right? Or you do, and then we will definitely come talk to you. All right, fairly quickly, I want to talk about just some little bit uh, headpieces, and then we're done. All right, so in Bella Clara, there's a lot of different headpieces that actually exist, all right? So in, in Polansko Dolina, there's a pozel. So this is for a lady who is married. Okay, so she, there's, some, there's some lace in the front and then it looks like it's pointed in the very back. And then it's tied with a, a piece of, um, just another piece of fabric, for instance, and then you put like a right, little bow. So um, great example, fairly easy to make. But again, it's only for there. So you don't mix and match in this case. Yugla is this one. Okay, this is for the village uh, of Sivar. This is normally, of course, to kind of keep your hair all together and then, you know, you kind of put something through it to keep it up, right? Kwachkanya, right? But it's, uh, and these are, uh, you can find a lot of these in the museum in Vidlika. They've been really, they've got a lot, they've got a, they've got a gold mine. All right? Yauba, ah, Yauba. Now, these are all, now this is now considered to be a form of Alba, right? A Zaviyachka is a form of Alba, right? So uh, when a lady is married, there you go. From Adlishichi, check out the checkerboard here, red and blue, right? And it was normally, even though groups may not do it, but they were normally always under a kerchief, right? You have to keep everything in position. Sometimes you don't see the uh, detail. This is a Yalba. So this is from Pozemel, the Metlika area. Again, for the most part, hidden away, right? Um, lately, a lot of people have been making these. I have a lot of friends who are like, hey, check it out. You want to make a few more? A lot of embroidery. Aparta. Aparta is actually known also in Prekmaria, but not this kind. Right? But aparta, thin or thicker, again, normally Young ladies wear this, not women, right? Not married women. Uh, in this case as well, beads and wax. I think you're all familiar with Pecha and Ruta, I think. All right. Um, white on white. Yeah, it could be as simple as that or as simple as the one that's there and very, very skurum, like very, like humble, very, right? Or a little more crazy and larger, like larger. All right. Um, I I took that. I remember taking that photo uh, on the very left hand side, and it shocked me when I found it. Because I, well, when I flood these slides, I put everything in. I just kind of pip, uh, push and pull. Uh, as a, a sweetheart of a lady uh, that I learned a lot from, gave me a lot of opportunities. Who's, who's, who's unfortunately passed on. And uh, yeah, we suckered her into, uh, hey, can you be the model for this? So again, a pitch, it doesn't always have to be tied up here. It can be tied around. Normally it was tied differently, right? Um, 
and in this case, around the neck and in the back. Again, it very large. Now, the gloves. This is only worn for one week after she got married. Okay, this is not a Slovenian invention. This is this was brought from Croatia, but our ladies wore them different in the in this case, right? So in Croatia they wore them further up, and our ladies wore them in the very back, right? So you can see the woolen, right, or the linen. Uh, it's usually woolen. Um, Strands on the back. The red was all woven, so it was right. So it's cardinal, right? And um, only the back part of it was to cover her back. And after so about a week after she was married, she would go from house to house, kind of, right? And and people were offer her things, and she wore this. After that week was done, that was retired, and then she was all kerchief. She's done after that. Uh, there's a lot of people trying to reconstruct these. All right, and this is what they are. So they actually are rectangular, then they're folded like so, and then they're kind of wrapped around. If anybody's got a, one of these kicking around, let me know. <laughs> I know a lot of people looking for these. All right, Stepanje. Uh, there are, I believe, I'm going to lie if there were four or five. Um, I'm going to let you know that these are now found online if you're resourceful. You, the actual entire book is scanned. Yes, it's there for free. You don't have to pay for it. Okay. Um, so, Stepanya was done for some of the reasons, especially around Vinitsa. All right. The patterns are kind of all there. This is from the museum there. Somebody actually did the, the examples. Right. And you will see them on the costuming. They're done in various parts. All right, even around the neck and things. Again, very humble. They're not, not necessarily flash. There's another form that's called the razlichanje. Yeah? All right, and then this again is also powder, right? and found also in some areas. But this is only done, I would say, in black threads. Check out the gathering. Oh, when I say valence, right? Like you know the, right? You can kind of see it here. When it comes to um, like the ribbed, Whew. you don't need it today. It's 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 cold, but it's not this cold, right? But if you were cold, right? Think of well, inside out current jacket, <laughs> or like this. These were common too, or very forms of these. And we're going, to st uh, we're going to end with this. Um, Dragatush being such a very, um, I'm going to say, influential group. There's a lot of influential groups, by the way, in Bela Kraina. Uh, I can't say enough about, like, especially Vinitsa and Dragatush, um, for what they've done with the culture there. They've actually even kind of resurrected other groups that have been established for longer to kind of uh, kick it up a notch. Okay? Um, they have a white costume that I kind of showed you. But they also went for something a little bit more um, modern, all right? So they went for what a, like a lot of people refer to these as chernanosha, right? You have to realize that a lot of people, again, with the industrial area and the way that people kind of moved back and forth, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and the way the wealth was, again, there was not a lot of wealth, but um, people started dressing the same. So right? Throughout Slovenia, throughout Europe, everybody dressed the same. So uh, in, in their cases there, what they did is they actually found a lot of old black and white, and they've reconstructed a lot of those old black and whites and are using those as well in their programming. And I think it's an absolutely great idea. Um, the two ladies here, mom and daughter, um, are influential because they've sewed every single costume. Um, I think that her mom, uh, and again, I... I brought my poor son to Bela Kraina to show him Bela Kraina. He knew exactly what was going on. How many people were visiting? <laughs> I said, we're spending three days here. And he goes, okay. No big deal. We went to the museum. You could kind of picture what the poor child had to do. Um, but I made sure I fed him well. And when I needed him all, hey, can you put this on? I just need to take a picture. He goes, if you post that picture. By the way, there's no picture of him on here. 
even though I really wanted to. Um, but they, you know what, people will open their doors. And that's one thing. If there is something that you're interested in, um, if I can help you, by all means, I will gladly help you. Um, or I can point uh, direction. And again, um, if you're ever in Slovenia, you know what, approach people and just say, where's this from? What is it? You know, do you make it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the sharing the wealth, I think, is something that Slovenians can do well. They don't always do well. You know, I've had a few conversations. Slovenians are Slovenians, right? Če je moja, je moja, right? If it's mine, it's mine, right? Um, but do I want to share it? I'm going to say, I could fall into the point of going, no, you know what, if I found it, I'm going to use it and no one else is going to get it. But then I thought to myself, it's not going to help anybody out either, right? And that's one of the reasons that I started the, started the site. There's the site, right? Um, and again, if, if there's a lot of, uh, the areas I actually have, if you go into the photos, you can go to the albums and you want to write up, I'll give you a novel and then you'll get photos in there and it might help you out as well. Um, but what I find is that sharing, you know, the sharing is caring idea. And if people are using it for the right reason, I think that we're all more, more up to help each other um, because there is so much that is out there. Even with the white costumes that are here, I mean, we could just dive into one costume and you can see that. But I wanted to give you a little bit of eye candy. I wanted to give you a little bit of, whoa, I never thought of that. Or that would be kind of cool. Um, when you ask me my opinion, I'm going to be very honest with you. For those of you that know me well, I don't hold back. But I don't do it maliciously. Right? Um, I think last year, um, we, uh, the consulate general was in there and I mentioned something about Slovenian and Slovene as a word. I don't like the word Slovene, by the way. I don't like it. Um, it just has connotations for me. And she was the only one that was against me. And then I met her after the presentation. And she goes, oh, yeah, you know, we already spoke. And I was like, oh, great. Yeah, first impressions are awesome. I said, I'm black and white. She goes, I realize that. She goes, so am I. And I think that's great. Um, but again, I think a little bit of debate is great. And a little bit of back and forth and sharing is absolutely fine. You know? I want to thank the two that actually got that got dressed. I know we, were, we, you and I have been chatting online for a little bit of time, you know. And I said, you know, when they asked, "Can we get dressed?" and I'm like, oh, "Okay, what kind of costume do you have?" That's the way I think, right? You know, because again, um, I've had people who have come and say, "Okay, this is what I made." I go, "Great, that's," you know, but I don't have a very good poker face sometimes in regards to it. But again, I understand the limitations of knowing how to sew and knowing it and, and doing it and time, right? There are people that w you can't spend so much time doing certain things unless you're dedicated to it. So like I can tell you that one costume from Istra, I know it's not from this region, but uh, if you don't have a thousand hours to spare, you're not going to have a costume that's going to be as, as, as authentic. But when you see it, you're going to be like going, wow, right? It is what it is. But, but no matter what you wear, wear it with pride. Don't wear it for mascarada, by the way. Costuming is not for mascarada. Please. Okay? A costume is not for mascarada. Maybe, maybe portions of it. But um, don't wear a costume and say, hey, here we go. Um, but whatever you have, cherish it. Wear it with pride. And again, try and foster what you can. If I can help, you can reach me this way. Some of you asked me for my email. I'll gladly do that as well. Not a big deal. Um, hopefully you got something out of today. I know I went above time. We started late though, huh? Uh, but again, uh, when, it, when it comes to um, trying to share information, there's a lot of info that is out there. But, you know, um, and again, depending on the village you're from and, and things, if you're, this is part of your, uh, your village might not have something specific, right? But again, it is what it is. Okay. Hope you had an okay time this afternoon. Thanks for coming out. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to invite, we have people in the audience here who have come in costume. I'd like to invite you to come forward and just give a few words about what you're wearing today and uh, a little explain a little bit about what you have and, and maybe if there's a story behind it. Uh, can you join me over here? I'm okay. going to go on this side now. Go ahead and introduce yourself and stage. just give a little bit of a story about explaining what you have on. Okay. I'm Annie Hosvar, or in Slovenian, Marianza Kuchiavar. Um, this, I think it was my mom's 
I'm not positive, but. Um, it's gorgeous, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Um, we come from Lakva, which is a village in Chernamal. And ours was always white. My dad was always like, it's gotta be all white, no, no embroidery or anything like that. No hanky at the belt and you wear a red belt or not. But uh, beads, yeah, something like that. Um, beads, he always said lots of beads. And my mom, she was like always red beads and the more you put on, the better it is. Sometimes I'll put multiple beads on, but that's yeah. all I can tell can you. Can you turn around for a sec? Yeah. Sure. Oh. Yes. Uh, the other thing, which I haven't done, but on the socks, my mom said that they would put red um, ribbons with tassels on it, so when you would dance, you could, you know, see. But I, I don't that's, have that That's yet. pushing the envelope there, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But you wanted to see the back. This is a bit straight. So the back in this case is shorter. So there's a lot of there's a lot of debate of why, right? And so the the question always was. Was it just an old blouse that people found, and because women were smaller, do you know? Do you know? But this is this is a jumper underneath. Yes, it is. Yeah. So oh, I know that. Sorry, but yeah, yeah, no, you have a jumper underneath. So really, there is nothing for you to tuck it into. So I don't know why you would have to have it longer. Yeah, but the, but the, the front, but the question is, why is it not clean line? Do you know what I mean? Women were always very clean. Guys, were, we we really weren't. <laughs> Comfort. They work, Slovenians work a lot, so I don't know. Comfort, you know, you yeah. didn't have to worry about anything coming up. If you want to tuck that in, you could. If not, you That's, left it open. So my suggestion to you is, is in the, in the winter, put that probably. in your apron over it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very nice I would imagine it would be cooler in the summer. I like wearing it in the summer. It's a little cooler because I can go with sandals or barefoot if I want. Right. I don't have to wear all that stuff on there, though. Can you talk a little bit about tying and your handkerchief and how you get it to stay up? You, well, you have lace on the edges and the part that you tie up here, you have to starch. So it's not starched super well right now, but you can starch oh. it very heavily. And then when you tie it, it stays up like that for you. Um, depending on where you're from, you tied it differently. Um, we have friends from Metlika, and they do theirs on Zaitsev Wuha. We do ours on Petelin. Um, and all you do is you, you have, it's a big square. It's a big square of fabric with lace. You fold it in a triangle. Then you make it, or tie it like this, pull the, top, the ends, the corners, and then you just tie a knot. And Who tied that? I did. By yourself? Yeah, well, he had to help me a little bit. There's a, okay. there a pin there. Oh, yeah. oh that's put, okay. Pins. I put a pin. Oh, I've used, I've used multiple pins to keep it up. That's amazing. I put a pin in it because it just, because it loosens. Oh, yeah, and I like sure. somebody to help me yes. tie it super, super tight so that it doesn't fall off your head. Especially in Kres when we danced, we always tied them like this. And you had to tie them super tight because when you danced, it could fly off your head, and I believe your aunt's pitcha fell off one time when we were dancing. Oh, the stories are coming out. <laughs> I didn't off her head, but yeah. So this is your mom's. Did mom, was do you know if did. mom made it? Do you know if she no, made it? I don't think so. No, she got it. She got it from there. Yeah, she made my Gurenska nosha. She didn't make the Belenkinska. So, but they're all similar. You say you wear it. Do you yeah. wear it for a particular festive thing here? Um, like, do you wear it for like, um, like Pentecost, or do you like do you wear it for like? Um, we like, wear it for for all the like for Easter. Yeah. We, we yes. Are, like, Is that a big thing here for Easter? Yeah. People come in. in I, I do. I do see a social media thing, but I don't know when they're all out. Right. Yeah. But so, would you wear this for for Easter, for instance? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You would wear this over your Gorenska. I don't. I gave my Gorenska well, away. I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I played with the Alpine Spectacular. Okay. Player, and 
and my, my Norsha was always Gorinska Norsha, which we got from Lublana. Yes. So last year, uh, Bishop Sayek came from Novomisto. Yes. And, you know, being Dolenz, and I was born in Novomisto, but our parents were, Marianza and I are brother and sister. Yeah. So our, our, my mom's from Chernobyl, my dad's from Samich. Yes. And you, Bishop Sayek from that region, I says, heck, I got to put my Norsha. Right. And then, you know, I thought to myself, I said, I'm always wearing a Bill of Crimes, a Gorinska Norsha, but I'm not a Gorinz, I'm a Bill of Crimes. So you're going to see me now, I'm going to ditch the, the other <laughs> one, and I'm going to wear this. And I, she and I were the only ones. And it really kind of stood out. I thought it, it popped because it's so white and vibrant. And everybody, everyone is just used to thinking, you're Slovenian, the Gorinska Norsha is if you're a true Slovenian, you're wearing I got it. Uh, with no. Now, you know? <laughs> but that's no, I know. I just, well, when, everyone associates being Slovenian with that Narod Nadosha. Right. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, it does better in the media, I think, because it's so colorful. These are plain, they're white. So I guess it's not as interesting. Well, I apply to for not only wearing it here, but wearing it otherwise, because we need to, and again, I'm not against any region here, but I think the diversity of Slovenian costumes need to be celebrated, because there's so many of them, right. right? To the point where, I get what you're saying about media, but I've seen so many really bad, I'm not saying from here, but I've seen so many bad reproductions that something like this, or I'm going to use like something simple as this, done so well, it made a thousand times better. That's a better representation. I can tell you, like, like this Norsha, this, this is my uncle's. My dad's is too short for me. So if I wore his, it would be like way, way up here. But this is my uncle's who's a little bit taller than I am, but his arms are short. So in reality, this thing should be double roll. I called to Slovenia. Um, you might know Anna Markovic. Yes. She's like super, super busy. It's going to take a long time. Yes. I'd like to get the Norsha that the top that would fit you. But you notice, you know, the shoe may not necessarily match because the fabric changed, the pants were out, and these are getting all shot and so forth. The, the guy's notion is really- Well, I got a pair of hemp ones here if you would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? There's no buttons and this thing is open to the chest. I was yes. gonna go commando, but- <laughs> no. Hey, I think I said do as you wish. Yeah. So, no, yeah, and it's a little chest, so, but normally, you know, it's, it's, it's open. Yes. And, um, but, Years ago, I think in the late 60s, the Bill Kreisky Club was really active and it was, okay. it was large. All right. They all imported from Slovenia. So th yes. this is made the old Slovenia. way. And you know, we even know there's a thing called the Malatinsa, which you may, yeah. may or may not know. Yeah. It's a piece of board, maybe 12 inches wide or so, and about six or eight feet long. It has a hinge point. And then it has these teeth that come together like this. So it's the board is cut in a zigzag. And what they'll do is when the flax grows, they'll take it and just beat it. And there's a, they made, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, there'd be a dance involved around that, yeah. just, just to make it more festive. But they really beat this stuff until it gets yeah. soft and pliable, and that's how the linen is made. And then when you're, when you're putting the linen on the loom, it takes almost a week just to set it up before you can even start stitching. You know, the, the, idea of, the idea of linen, again, if all regions had it. I mean, I found out fairly recent. My grandfather actually, what could would weave. Yeah. Uh, my father remembered a pair of white pants because there was, there was you know, a lot of kids, right? They would get white pants, and he goes, he goes, he despised them so much that he would actually take the, the threads from the bottom and start peeling them out. He goes so he can get another pair of pants. Right, because he thought he was going to get a modern pair of pants, but he didn't get a modern pair of pants. But and and so my father was born in 1940. Right, so you, you got to think that that I mean, yeah, it was you know over 80 years ago, but that's in relative terms, that wasn't a long time ago, right? And there were there were older ladies that were still going to church in once in Bella Kaina, right? Oh, yeah. Generally, the men would evolve quick, yeah. right? Because again, they wore they went to work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the women. Um, especially the elderly women would be like, yeah, this is okay. Tell me dobra, right? So she might wear that, like the the top might change, but the bottom was still white, right? And I think that's why, like the um, Mithlika Museum actually has some really great pieces there. But and a lot of people say, oh, only so zastali, right? They were further back. Um, yes and no. Um, it is what it is. I mean, if we go into other areas, like we go to Gorenska, um, it's hard to get older stuff because most people just didn't want it. They got burnt it and they, they did whatever they did with it, right? 
So the only thing I haven't figured out is the style of the hat. You'll notice mine's like a round top. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of looking. You know, some guys would have, you know, it'd be a different look. Yeah. Right? Let's try that one. And my, which was interesting, my cousin in, in Chernobyl, he said, oh, that's Chernomaska Nosha, because the man's hat is round. Now, this I didn't get from here. Actually, I got this from the Mad Hatter here in Cleveland. And, you know, I, I kind of... And is that still open it, here? It, it's still open. Oh, we need to go visit. Yeah. And, you know, I noticed Amish, Amish fellas yes. will wear these hats. And the, the stitching around here, they have a stitching that holds the brim a little bit tighter. Yes. Kind of, kind of floppy. But this one, you know, this that is... That one was in a box. Can you tell it was in a box? Because it's, yeah. it's well, kind of a this side. Flat box. So, you know, this is... A, it's this way, but my head is a little bit different. And some will have, you know, they'll crush it. Crush yeah, it. So it. It depends on personal choice, but I think the region too has, I think Metlik has more of this. Well, you have to think every man was different too. And where did they buy it? That's the other thing, right? A lot of things are influenced of where, like, who are they buying from, right? So, for instance, like I said, Kuteria, they bought a lot of like stoff, and they bought a lot of woolens from there as well. But again, did they buy from Croatia? And, and again, the, you know, we think borders are borders and nobody went outside of the borders. Hello, I'm from over the border. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of that. Or, so even the hats were, who was the supplier? Or who was the local person that created it, right? So again, that, what was common was maybe more common because it bought from the same source. I also want to let everybody know, as you can see along the walls here, we have a number of costuming pieces that okay. um, were brought in or not, are yeah, on loan here yeah. from yeah. Uh, well, courtesy of Folklore and Scoopina Krias, which is our Cleveland folk dance group, as well as pieces that David has brought down from Canada um, to display here. So we, for our online audience, we're going to take pictures and post them uh, alongside the video here. For everybody here in person, um, welcome to come and look at them. I don't know, but is there anything in the last few minutes that you wanted to say about the pieces that you've brought? There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is right here. This is also the Kochamaika, right? The more modern top. Again, this is not only one pattern. This is just a, right? When it comes to it, this is, of course, all open here, very tight. Um, if I said, the only thing we have right now, the only thing I have from Costel is something that I created. There's that apron. Very, very thin, right? Very thin. Uh, and then here, thanks to Ursi for bringing two pieces for, from Chris. These two. Um, and then we've got various, again, from Prek Muria, uh, including a belt, right? And I talked to you about the, um, the, the shawls, right? These were kind of more like Shtarska. Um, my grandmother got two of these um, that were kind of handed down, right? When people passed, when her mother-in-law passed away and my mom wanted them badly, right? When, when my grandmother passed away. Um, so something, a little eye candy, but again, a lot of white. And I noticed it as I was placing it down going, no, everything's white. That's why I think I asked you for something colored. So what about, you know, the embellishment? Is there any kind of significance as far as colors go? Like, were there, for instance, were there certain dyes that were more available? Okay, you have to question. Oh, I love that question. You have to consider that dyes were mostly natural, right? So when we, like, you know, we talk about, like, greens, for instance, everybody was like this vibrant green. Well, vibrant, how are you going to make vibrant green, right? So dyes, everything was more natural. So you have to consider that if you're doing a reconstruction, try and stay within those boundaries. There is one oddity, and it's indigo blue, right? Because there is a plant that um, you can actually do stamping with uh, with indigo, right? The blocking, um, and it's called Podrotisk. That was known through a lot of Slovenia, Poland, um, Slovakia, Czech, Hungarian, and what they used to do is take linens, for instance, and then they used to put, they used to create. There's patterns. Um, Lublanska um, Ethnographic Museum has a whole bunch of them. So what they used to do is they, um, I don't know if it's a wax, it's something that what we put on it, and then you would literally stamp your fabric, and then at the very end you would put this into the indigo blue, right, because it was extracted from a plant, right? 
Ironically speaking, I always heard about this and I've seen exhibits with this. I was in Taiwan, of all places, and we went to a cultural center and there was a woman there with gloves like this doing exactly what I'm telling you. So it was something that was widespread. It wasn't just European. Uh, but all others were very, um, like reds weren't like bright, bright, bright red. Reds were almost like clayish red, black. You know, again, we're going more solid, right? We're going blacks and browns and like, like more um, greens that are like grassy greens and like very earth tones, right? When it comes to like light blues and stuff like that, that wasn't really the case until industrial era and then cottons came out. I mean, when cotton came around, everybody wanted cotton. Screw that. I'm not going to wear leather. Right, but that costs money, and ironically, a lot of cotton was actually imported from from the states, from North America. Right, that's one thing about these regions too uh, that blows my mind is there are a lot of people that actually emigrated to come to the United States or come to Canada and didn't stay; they went back. They made money and they went back, and they would do that two or three times. I actually found out I had a relative that did exactly that that came to the states twice, and they went back. Both times, I made my money, I got what I want, and I went back. And I wanted to start a family, but oh, wait a minute, let me go back and make more money, right? And some people, of course, stayed, hence why some of you are here, right? Some people left for other reasons later on. Um, the world is small, and you know it's a lot smaller now, but even then, I mean, there, was, there was some back and forth. So color-wise, if you're if you're looking at doing reconstructions of certain costumes, consider where you where you want like what area you're doing, and then what do you want to do, and how far back. If it's something more modern, you can kind of get away with different different colors, right? But it's kind of like doing a like a Gorenska and bright bright candy apple red. Would you do that? Well, you know, most people go, oh, that would look really nice. Would that be true? Most people go, well, it looks good, right? But I'm going to tell you, if I do some research uh, in Skofioloka. Bright red, but bright red and white stripes. Because that's what they made in Skopje Loka. Right? So thank you. Hang on. I'm going gonna, gonna to yeah. wrap this up because our live stream is ending right now. Oh, are we still but, online? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, so we're going we're gonna to say goodbye to our online friends now and thank them all for coming. And thank you for coming and all of you here. Um, you. But if you guys would like to stay around and look at our costumes on display, have conversations, I welcome that. Um, and thank you guys all for coming. Before we do cut, I do want to remind everybody, we have another week coming of all kinds of events. So that includes tomorrow we're having a talk with Noah Charney, a New York Times selling best author about Slavic myths and his role um, in Slovenian tourism. So he's actually born in America, living in Ljubljana. That should be a great talk. The day after that, we have a talk about Idria lace. So if you're interested in handicrafts and fabric and that type of thing, this will also be of strong interest to you. These are all online. The next day, we have our online cooking demonstration with Mark Toms about an easy, very easy and fast. It takes three minutes to make Kamshneta. So this is a very sort of like cheater's method. It's awesome and it's so tasty. Um, after that, we have uh, our wine tasting is sold out. The uh, Prasheran Day event is at Slovenia National Home uh, on Thursday. Free. It's going to be so nice. There is complimentary food and wine, Slovenia wine compliments of the Slovenian Council General's Office, a poetry and jazz performance, and then a very, very rare opportunity to go inside the Deemer Mansion 